Hey, everybody. Uh, glad you could join us today. I'm Rick Kess, Director of Education Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, so nice to have you with us for today's webinar on getting K-12 right. Uh, my colleague, Mike McShane, who's with us today for the webinar and several other good friends, uh, and I just recently wrote a book, came out a couple weeks ago, called uh, Getting Education Right, um, a conservative vision for improving, uh, you know, early childhood, K-12 and college. And one of the things, what, what Mike and I really try to do in this book is sketch a principled conservative vision. Not conservative like politics. It's not like, do you like Republicans or Democrats? And not like, how do you feel about, you know, this presidential candidate or that one? But conservative in the sense of there are things that we believe in. There's values. There's intuitions. Um but getting education right is not just about values and beliefs and intuitions. It's about how do we actually put those in practice in a way that makes a difference for students, for families, for communities. And we talk about that in the book, but Mike and I are eggheads. I'm director of education policy studies at one of DC's think tanks. Mike's director of research, uh, of national research for Ed Choice, uh, one of the nation's preeminent champions of empowering uh, parents and families. Um, when we actually are interested in how these ideas we're talking about translate into the real world, where we're trying to make a difference uh, for kids and parents and communities, uh, we like to make sure that we are in a conversation with people who are doing that work every day. So that's what this conversation is about today. It's not about frustration with where we are. It's about how do we move forward and how do we do that in practical ways that make a real difference. So with us, uh, we have three... <laughs> three of the very best possible people I could think of for that conversation. Uh, we have Nikki Neely, uh, President of Parents Defending Education. We have Darrell Bradford, President of 50CAN. And we have Cade Brumley, uh, State Superintendent of Louisiana. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is how do we make real progress on things that matter and move forward. Um, if you're interested in asking particular questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, you've got Alana's email on the event page if you want to send a question. Uh, she will make sure I get that uh, through the chat. Um, also, if you get interested and you're like, oh, man, I haven't seen this book, but I want to check it out. Uh, if you go to the Teachers College Press website and enter the code AEI today, uh, you will get a 20% discount. So knock yourself out. Um, you know, the book's done well. Uh, we were delighted when somebody sent the screenshot that it had made it onto uh, United Airlines uh, on-air video entertainment. Uh, like, you know, it's these little things that always bring us great pleasure. Uh, but that's not why we write it. We write it because we're interested in what this means for the real world. So, Mike, let me throw the first question to you just to kind of get us started. Um, we talk a lot about the importance of educational choice, about empowering families um, as a mode of educational improvement. But in the book, we talk about how choice is a part of that, but it's not the whole ball game by any means. Can you talk a little bit as a guy who's in the leadership at Ed Choice, um, how you think about choice and what conservatives are getting right and wrong uh, when we think about the importance of educational choice? Absolutely. Thanks, Rick. Um, Look, it's hard not to be, if you, you're in school choice world, it's hard not to be excited right now. You know, I just um, finished a couple of weeks ago that great new biography of Milton Friedman. Jennifer Burns, she's a historian at Stanford. It's called Milton Friedman, The Last Conservative. Fantastic book. I recommend it to everyone. But I mean, if you think about it, he wrote the kind of seminal essay about school choice in 1955. And from 1955, you know, there were some, some fits and starts in various places that had had sort of proto-school choice movements. But until really the early 90s, it was a pretty long gap before anything was really happening policy-wise in that department. And then, frankly, from the early 90s until quite recently, most of the programs that we saw were quite small. They were limited to certain student populations. They had funding caps that were on them. And uh, then some sort of cracks in the dam started to emerge in places like Arizona and West Virginia. And then kind of as the pandemic was the big rush of water that came bursting through, suddenly now, um, over the course of 21, 22, 2023, um, you know, 10 states, 
past universal or near universal ESA programs. Just in the last couple of weeks, I believe Alabama is now the 11th. I think there is a bill waiting on the uh, governor of Wyoming's desk to, to become the 12th. We were just having a nice laugh before this because just this week introduced in Louisiana, something that will be in the pantheon of bill names, the Gator Act, which will be um, Arizona's universal ESA. So look, uh, it's an incredibly exciting time. And I think that uh, it's something that where conservatives, I think, have really decided to solve problems. <laughs> One of the things that's great about it is that you can do a lot of complaining about what's going on in the schools that currently exist, or you can try to create mechanisms to create new ones. And you can complain about bureaucracy and you can complain about sclerosis and all of these things. Or you can try and say, OK, well, how should we fund schools if we want different types of institutions to emerge? So I think if we want a more flexible system, if we want a more kind of human scaled system where you can have smaller um, educational enterprises and others, ESAs are a fantastic way to do it. So it's really heartening. I think it's a really positive story if you're on the right side of the aisle um, to tell over the course of the last couple of years. And I think points in a lot of directions of ways that conservatives can move forward in education policy. Mm. You know, Nikki, um, Mike just alluded to, you know, a lot of the frustration that we've all heard um, and experienced. I mean, a bunch of us have got our own young kids uh, over the last four or five years. We've certainly heard enormous frustration from conservative and centrist parents about some of what's going on at schools as far as ideology, um, some of the books that are getting stocked in elementary school libraries, the way schools are addressing questions of race and gender. Um, parents Defending Education has tried to address some of this. Um, you know, it's easy for us to spend a lot of time kind of exasperated, say, can you believe this? But what I like about what you guys are doing is you're also saying, how do we make parents heard in a way that actually drives productive change, that actually helps move schools in the right direction? Can you talk a little bit about that work? And what are a couple of the things that you all have noticed and learned in doing this over the last couple of years? Yeah, you know, one thing that struck me during lockdown, obviously, was um, just that people didn't really know how to engage at all. Like this was so many people's first rodeo. I remember I'm from Chicago. All my friends are Democrats. And I remember getting text messages at the beginning when schools were closed. My friends were like, how do we how do we like tell the principal to reopen the schools? And I was like, oh, bless your heart. You don't you know, they you think they care. Um, and, um, but that was really, that was kind of a wake up call to me because, right. Like I'm like a cynical kind of like beltway libertarian. And so like, I'm like, oh, of course they don't care. Um, but really just, you know, showing people that first what their rights are, because so many people, I think when they saw zoom school, they saw, you know, what their kids were learning, were not learning and didn't really like it, but they didn't know how to push back. They were scared. Right. I mean, think back to like spring 2020, right. All the George Floyd stuff. People were saying, you say the wrong thing and you're canceled for the rest of your life. And so people were not speaking up because they weren't sure. Um, and I think some of that was a function of just administrators throwing a lot of jargon at them. If you're being given like an acronym salad of PPRA, FERPA, da, 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 Title IX, people are like, okay, I give up. And so we try and do what I, I call like translating lawyer into English. Like this is what the First Amendment means. This is what compelled speech is. This is what Title VI is. Um, and so then people know where the red lines are. So if or when those red lines are crossed, they know it's not OK. You know, this is like I feel like it's like Stockholm syndrome, like, you know, you you, you don't have to take it. Um, and then we try and just give people really basic lessons on how to engage. Um, over the past two years, we've helped 62,000 people submit comments to the Federal Register on Title, on title IX. Um, most people don't know that you actually can have a voice in that process at the federal level or, frankly, at the state level. Um, and so just giving people, you know, here's how you set up an Instagram page. Here's how you start a parent group. Um, here's our, here are 10 questions to ask your teacher about curriculum. Um, so you don't have to go and be the person who's screaming, you know, invictives and swears at the top of your lungs at a school board meeting. But there are actually ways to get to yes. And one other thing, interesting thing to me is that, you know, for so many people, um, what they want is very different. Some people just don't want a homework assignment handed out again. Other people are like, I want to flip the school board. And so meeting people where they are and really listening to that and helping them, you know, get the knowledge that they need to get to a place where they're comfortable with their child's education has been something that's been really rewarding. Mm. You know, Cade, of, of all the times to be a state leader, this seems like it's got to have been one of the, you know, more stressful kind of stretches. Um, you know, so trying to keep the schools open and 
promoting Louisiana school choice. That wasn't enough for you. You also tackled uh, reading and literacy. You've also uh, waded right into uh, social studies debates. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you've navigated these? I mean, for a long stretch of your tenure, you've worked with a Democratic governor. You had a state board of education that was half Republicans, half Democrats. So is a guy who's recognized as a pretty staunchly principled conservative, how have you been able to move these things forward in that kind of environment? Well, first of all, Rick, thanks for uh, having us and thanks for having this conversation. You know, I, I would I would open just by saying that, you know, quality educational opportunities, they don't just sustain our republic, they improve her. Uh, and and further, they they validate the characteristics of our, our country and, and students uh, that help them understand the reason our country is, is worth protecting and defending. And so I think as a conservative leading in this particular this particular space, it's really important for us to not just talk about the things that we're against, um, because there are principal things that we are for. Uh, and, and those are those are really important. Uh, and those are the things for which we where we have tried to stand over the last few years and will continue to stand moving forward. Um, for us, it's about, you know, how can we uh, make sure that that, you know, liberty and freedom are protected for kids and families? Uh, how can we make sure that uh, we're focused on ABCs and one, two, threes and the primary responsibilities of schools and not radical ideologies? Um, and, and how can we continue to break down uh, bureaucracies? Uh, and, and, and we'll do that. And, and through all those things, we hopefully are, are empowering parents to make decisions on the, the schools that make the most sense for them. Uh, hopefully we're getting better academic outcomes for all kids because we're focused on things that truly matter in the pursuit of academic excellence. Um, and, and we're lifting our, our educators uh, to do this, this quality work and, and keep them on task and, and, and realizing uh, the importance that they play in our, in our society. Uh, and, and so we have, we have tried to, uh, and I believe we have, uh, navigate a, a really difficult political space, not just in Louisiana, but you know, certainly individuals are facing this across the country. But we've tried to keep the main thing, the main thing, uh, as much as possible. Uh, and that's that's student outcomes, and, and, and that's making sure we're transparent and we're breaking down barriers and we're putting parents in the driver's seat of their their child's education. And we're seeing gains in our state. Uh, but in a state like Louisiana that's long challenged and certainly has an opinion of being long challenged across the country, we have more work to do because that's what our kids and, and communities and families need and deserve. Real, real quick, because uh, I want to go to Darrell, but you know, one of the things you guys have done is you've tackled literacy. And one of the frustrations for a lot of us is education schools and the fact that they seem to teach impressionable teachers bad habits. Can you say just a couple words about how you guys have tackled this and how you've tried to change what happens even in teacher preparation? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we have passed, and I think our policymakers and our legislature on our state board uh, for helping us here and, and the energy and the jazz that we have in schools around this right now, but we, we have a lot of momentum around literacy. Um, we, of course, are, are, are going back to the basics, phonics-based instruction, uh, and that's with all practices in our schools, um, but it's also taking on colleges of education. Uh, and we were able to pass legislation that allowed our agency to essentially take control of the syllabus and the content uh, that's being taught in the colleges of education for literacy preparation for future teachers. And so we 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 have um, we have called out the literacy crisis that that we face in our state, and, and frankly, we face across the country. Uh, and and we believe that if we stop the confusing practices around teaching children to read and have a very principled, back to the basics, phonics and text rich approach uh, that we can move the needle. And in fact, our fourth graders led the country in Nate growth. And so we think that that, that is a very early sign uh, of what we believe we can still accomplish. But but look, Rick, and I know we wanna to get to uh, Darrell, but with all the talk around literacy in our state um, and the movement that we're seeing in literacy in our state, math is getting jealous. And so now it's time we also have to tackle math. Uh, and, and we believe that if we take the, the, the basic principled, again, approach to teaching students how to do math at an early, early grade level, build math fluency in the same way that we build literacy fluency, then, then we can make progress here. And, and by God, we have to stop telling children that are first graders that they're not a math kid. You know, every child has to be a math kid. Uh, and we have to do our work to make sure that, that that's happening in schools across the state of Louisiana. 
And, and, and are you looking to uh, mimic California's promising strategy of eliminating advanced math in grades one to 10? No, Rick, I think, you know, we still believe merit matters. Uh, you know, you have to earn the, the, the title of champ. Not everyone is a champ. Uh, but we're we're still we're still building uh, the, those characteristics in students, and we believe merit matters, and um, we're we're not going to take that approach. Terrell, you know what's interesting in this stuff is, you know, you are not a conservative. You are maybe the most purple guy I know doing this work today, which is it's no easy thing to be that purple in 2024. Uh, but you are a guy who's unabashedly about empowering families. You're unabashedly critical of bureaucracies. So, you know, if there's anybody in a great position to be a critical friend, uh, I, I think it's probably as you look up at as you look at the conversation today um, on these issues that we're talking about. What do you think conservatives are getting right in terms of making a difference for kids and families? And where do you think we've got to up our game? Wow. So uh, th thank you for having me. And um I thought we were friends, but you put me after Kate, so I guess we're not friends anymore. Um, but uh, uh, it, it is I did, he, he wore the he wore the tie, baby. He brought he, it. It was it was really good. He brings, all, he brings Kate it, energy. Tutoring too, uh, Louisiana also leading on tutoring is a, a, a big deal. There's a lot uh, good going on in um, in Louisiana, and uh, like this thing about being solutions oriented is very important. And so it's it's good to look at you know. Um, uh, Mississippi, Arkansas, you know, like, like a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of red states actually are doing sort of, um, poor instructional things right now that a lot of blue states seem to be making like a jump ball, you know, like for instance, whether or not we're going to teach kids to read versus teaching them to guess. That's kind of, you know, that shouldn't be a jump ball, but let's say so like, yeah, we want to do the sound out thing, not the guest thing, you know, so so that's the thing. Um, I would just say, let me give this back to you differently. Um, and I appreciate the purple setup. Uh, I, I think, you know, uh, coincident with the polling from a couple of years ago that all of a sudden was like, yeah, maybe we trust conservatives or Republicans more with education. We, we trust Democrats, which is like a real, you know, kind of sea, sea change. There's been a, a lot of post-pandemic policy that essentially means that if you are like a traditional conservative or small C conservative or values or have a values-based approach as you and Mike um, uh, enumerate in the book, you, you're basically the dog that caught the car right now, right? And, and so you're, you're on top of the world, like you have a, you have a lot of, of public support around things like that are seemingly basic, like teach kids to read, right? Like, like make sure that they're prepared to participate in our democracy as equal citizens, make sure they can feed their families, be, you know, re, uh, uh, you know, respected in the, and in the economy, people are like, yeah, that sounds, you know, really good to me. Uh, but then at the same time, you have the chance to condition set, which I think is really important. And so this whole, you know, Mike talked about ESAs and obviously there's a, a lot about school choice in the book, um, uh, of, of which I am a, a devotee for anybody who doesn't know. Um, but I think the most important thing about choice, and you say it, is that it's like, it, it's not a thing. It's a state of things, right? So it's, so it's not like, it's not like capitalism. It's like money, you know, like you can, you can make a lot happen when you have money, you know, what, what you buy is kind of, is kind of up to you. And I think right now we're at this place where conservatives do have like a, a grand, opportunity given ESA passage, like in some and some of the sort of return to basics that we're talking about, to reset the table, not only around what is essential, but what is possible in terms of like modes of schooling, you know, who's in the profession, uh, diversity of approach, like, like, you know, all, all of these other things. One, one small thing on this fun fact, but I think is really good. You guys also talk about confident you know, pluralism in the book, which I think is really interesting. And I don't want to, uh, I don't, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll sing a, a hymn to Nikki here. But um, to me, the, the number one thing, particularly during, you know, after the pandemic that, um, that I just can't shake is that we have to have a schooling sector that the government doesn't run because the government schooling sector is inordinately sort of like uh, at the whim of politics. 
And so you can navigate to politics well, as Superintendent Brumley has done, um, and you can be in a state that might prioritize things one way or another, or you can navigate them poorly and be a part of a $190 billion smash and grab that the New York Times said the other day meant that, you know, a lot of poor black kids may never catch up. I mean, this is like, this stuff is really bad. And so if you don't have independent schools or or or, or pods or any, or micro grants, uh, you know, or any of these other things that allow other things to be tried, like you only get what the, what the political system can give you. And so I'm, you know, I'll, I'll be reductionist. I'll just say families need insurance, you know, and I think that the conservatives are in a position to help provide that now as well. That's great. Um, if it works for you guys, I think what I'm inclined to do is just throw out some topics that I think are top of mind for a lot of parents and school leaders and have you guys talk about what should we be doing about these things? Um, either we're already doing them and we should do more of it or things that we're not doing that we need to be. Uh, but let's start with one, which has been getting a lot of attention the last six or 12 months, is chronic absenteeism um, of, of students, also of teachers. Um, you know, Tim Daly wrote a terrific piece the other day reminding everybody that we've seen really high levels of teacher absenteeism. Um, what do we do about that? How big a problem is chronic absenteeism? And how do we start getting our hands around this and addressing it? Before anybody says anything practical about it, can I give something anecdotal on this? Please. So it's, um, you know, a lot of time when I talk about school, I talk about it as a ritual, right? The schooling ritual. And there, um, you know, there's a time and a place that you go to it. There's a hamster wheel you get on and, and over time you get used to it. And almost hiding in plain sight during the, during the pandemic was like, oh, wait, hold on. You mean if we let the kids stay home for a couple of years, they might be like, yeah, I don't want to go back to school. Nobody thought that that would have an effect on the adults too. And then one day the adults are like, oh yeah, I don't know about this go back to school thing. I mean, if you go all the way back to the front of it, when the when a UTLA had a, a, a an MOU with the district that basically said the teacher is optional, I mean, teachers get the message, you know? So, so w while um, short of just like paying more, which I think is, is something a lot of people will suggest um, that, you know, that might be the thrust of some folks. I do think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, we change the behavior of a, a large portion of 3.1 million people. And we're seeing the, the effect of that now. Nikki, I'm curious, you know, what, what are you hearing from, parents on chronic absenteeism and what, what 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 are you thinking as far as possible strategies? No, I mean, I think Darrell's right in that obviously, you know, families got used to not going, which was one problem. Um, and I think, you know, one part that I, I see kind of absent from this conversation in conservative education policy is the responsibilities that come along with this, right? I mean, this is like the Spider-Man quote, right? With great power comes great responsibility. And we, you know, we hear over and over again, parental rights, parental rights, but like, you have to make your kids show up. I don't really like leaving my house at 7.30 every morning to drive my kids to a private school a half hour away. And we're going to be homeschooling next year. And so it will be like, you know, was one of the questions this morning was like, do we still have to wake up at seven o'clock? Like, no, you don't. But, you know, and it's it's been interesting to watch some different schools kind of try and dial in, you know, what fits family schedules. I just got some ad yesterday in the Arlington online newspaper about a, an alternative school for neurodiverse kids that starts at 10 a.m. And so I think, you know, to Darrell's earlier point about how, you know, there are other options now that are, you know, meeting people where they are. I, even though we have seen this kind of tremendous crumbling, I think we're also starting to see really interesting innovation where it's meeting families where their needs are too. Um, and so it's really, you know, kind of incumbent on just the government to get out of the way. I mean, one thing we hear from parents is now that some of these districts are sending out basically bounty hunters, right, to go make the absentee kids show up, these parents are now like, is this a misdemeanor? Like, will this impact my, like my loans, my job, my et cetera. And so like, are we criminalizing parents for this behavior that they kind of got acclimatized to? And I think we're starting to create, you know, as much as we hear about the school to prison pipeline, like it's going to hit parents too. And so I think we have not yet begun to see the fallout from this. Um, so it's, it's very much an evolving situation, but people are not happy about the absenteeism. I mean, one of the consequences, obviously, you know, we're now looking at 28, 29% of kids 
or missing at least 10 days of school a year. That's not just those kids. It's if you're a teacher and every day you've got two, three, four kids absent, you've then got to worry about how do you catch those kids up? It creates distractions. Cade, curious about how, how you're thinking about this uh, in Louisiana. Yeah, first of all, I would say that, you know, uh, if if Nikki were one of our parents in Louisiana, I, I wouldn't be so concerned about her kids. I mean, I think she's got it under control. They're they're going to be fine. The, the, the challenge becomes uh, some of the students for whom they're not under any form of supervision or support at, at home. And, you know, we hear from law enforcement uh, oftentimes about crime and other situations as a result of chronic absenteeism. Uh, and that's beyond just the fact of the, the absolute learning loss uh, that's happening as a result of kids not being in school. So, you know, with with government here coming to the conversation, uh, I, I would say that, you know, it is. Um, it is troubling. Um, you know, our truancy rates are high. They're high across the country. Um, and I am I am certainly concerned about uh, our students who definitely uh, need some form of, of education every day that the school is providing uh, outside of, you know, the parent or guardian that's super supportive, like in the case of, of, of Nikki. Um, so what what we are doing in our state is is we're kind of launching a uh, a, a more holistic approach to this. And we're trying to pull a number of people around the table to talk about this issue. And so we'll be launching that next month. And so it'll be parents. Um, it'll be, you know, faith-based community. Uh, it will be our attorney general's office. Um, it will be more of a, a whole of community approach to try and look at what are the root causes of the issue? What's good, what's bad? Uh, where can individual groups within their circle of influence help in this particular effort? Um, but beyond that, uh, to, to flip the conversation a, a little bit, I, I would also just like to talk about um, for, for students who are on level, who are proficient, um, I think we have an opportunity now to think about seat time in different ways, too. You know, we, we all have this uh, thought of, around, you know, a, a student has to be in a school for X amount of days and X amount of minutes and, and do Y thing. Um, but, you know, that that should be differentiated based on individual student need. If, if a student has mastered content on the third day of school, you know, why keep them in that particular class for the next you know 160 days? It just doesn't make sense. And so I think we need to think about um, seat time, mastery of content uh, as we move into um, into new conversations around this particular space. Mike, um, two points out here that I'm curious about. One is I'm um, curious if, you know, Nikki was just talking about parental responsibilities as kind of a counterpoint parental rights. Could you put that in a broader frame? What should, what need, what do we need to be doing from the bully pulpit or in terms of how we think about schooling nationally uh, in terms of that? And second, Kay just mentioned this notion of thinking differently about school schedules and calendars. Ed Choice has obviously done some tripping polling on what students and families want on this. Wonder if you could talk about that a little bit in terms of this notion of being responsive to what families need, even as we expect parents to be responsible for their half of this kind of proposition. Yeah, absolutely. I'll answer the second part first because there's a good sort of data point here. So yeah, we at EdChoice, we pull a nationally representative sample of parents every month, uh, pull a nationally representative representative sample of Americans every month as well. And roughly every quarter to six months, we poll a representative sample of teachers, and we pulled various special populations throughout the time, parents of students with special needs, others. Um, we have consistently found um, between 40 and 50%, and this goes back at least two or three years now, of parents, of teachers, and of teenagers, when we poll 13 to 18 year olds, say that they would like some kind of hybrid school schedule which is they would like some sort of flexibility where they would stay home between one and four days a week and work from home, it's between 40 and 50%. Roughly around 10% of each of those populations would want to homeschool full-time, and then the other sort of 50% want uh, five-day-a-week school, whether that would be uh, private, public, or, or otherwise. So yeah, so there's this big pocket. And initially, when we broke it down by like school of origin, um, it they, they converged a bit more, but initially it was like private school families. It was up in like the 60s, like 60% 60 of families wanted some sort of schedule like that. So so parents are telling us, and when we've done polling around other sort of um, uh, tutoring and things like that, there's lots of interest from parents that are out there that, that, that need to meet there. But look, 
to answer the first part of your question, and I think really building off what both Cade uh, and, and Mickey and, and Darrell too, we're all talking about. I mean, I think two points are, are worth making um, that we both make kind of relatively early on in the book. One of which is this idea from at least from the bully pulpit, rhetorically, philosophically, this idea of education is a handshake. That it is between students and teachers, between parents and schools. Um, and the only way kids' education really works is if both sides of those hands are firmly grasped with one another. And obviously, I think this has influenced Rick. You and I were both teachers. We are both parents now. And we recognize, look, if you're the, the teacher who, you know, a student is misbehaving in class or they're behind in class, or a good example that most people can empathize with is like they have their cell phone out in class. There's a no cell phone policy. You take the cell phone, you take it down to the office and after school, you're in there when the parent comes in and they just like rip the phone out of the principal's hand and hand it back to the kid. Like, well, we've been completely undermined here and it's very difficult for us to say that you want to do this. So that's what's going to happen. And that's, you know, chronic absenteeism, I think, is just the, the extreme end of that, right, which is not valuing what's going on. And look, that makes we have to be really honest that that makes teachers and administrators jobs incredibly challenging. And in some ways, you know, I think it's worth cutting them some slack every once in a while to say, hey, listen. What are you doing? What are the steps you're taking and holding them accountable for their part of the handshake? Uh, but being realistic, the other part has to be in there. And I think that's where what something that Cade said is so important and something that we try to talk about in the book of this idea of kind of enmeshing children in webs of support, like interlocking layers. One of the things that I think we found out in the pandemic is that if it's sort of like a child's life is like home and school, and those are like the two things to which they are connected. Those are two failure points, right? Where if like either of those things stops working, that has like a catastrophic impact on a child's life. If though that child has a faith community that they're part of, if they're in a rec basketball league or soccer league, or if they're, you know, in the Cub Scouts or the Girl Scouts or whatever, and those, all of those interlocking layers, think of like a Venn diagram that's all around them. That connects them in ways, it supports them in ways, it prevents them from sort of falling through the cracks. Um, and there are all sorts of ways in which faith communities with nonprofits, sports leagues, et cetera, can really think about that. But I think it's not just the school's answer, and frankly, it's not just a parent's answer, but it's really engaging the civil society and thinking about, okay, here is this child who may be in a really difficult situation. How many circles can we draw around that kid? How many institutions are they attached to? How many communities are they a part of? And um, and then what can we do to uh, to strengthen that? Mike, and we can, may have lost. Did we lose? We look. We can just no, let's, this, let's is keep jazz, it this is let's jazz keep here. This is jazz. We keep it going. <laughs> no, but Mike, can, can I hop hop on that? Because yeah, uh, like like same same. I want to continue with because I think it's really important. So um, one, I just want to I want to say that like part of the reason why I'm so bullish on ESAs is because I believe they're a bit. They have a the ability to help supplement a kid's life in in the rest of the web, you know. So like school sports, tutoring, all all, all the, I mean, um, you know, club sports rather too. All these all these other things. I think those are um, uh, important byproducts of more flexible spending on education and growth. If that makes any sense. Um, but I do want to stick on something. So. Uh, for me, like the last three years, one of the things that the nation has been struggling struggling with is reseeding the the sort of is is making the relationship between parents and schools or school bureaucracies in balance again, right? Um, because obviously the pandemic threw it way out of balance for a lot for lots of people at, at uh, lots of different levels. But that can go both ways, and I, and so I I only want to highlight this because I think the handshake thing is really important. So um, your colleague, I can't believe I'm going to big up him on here because he already he gets bigged up enough. Your colleague, Robert, Robert Pondicio, he wrote a book called How the Other Half Learns about uh, Success Academy Charter Schools in New York City, where I am a board member. Uh, so we got like 48, that, 48 schools and 22,000 kids, and it is rigorous. Like So the handshake there is a firm one, like a first date, like bring my daughter back kind of handshake, like leave with your hand hurting. Um, because what we are trying to do, right, which is really important, is communicate what we want from you, and you have to communicate what you expect from us at the same time. And it only works 
if there's an understanding and both people are on the same page. And I can remember when the book came out, um, there was a lot of heat in, you know, in the, the blogosphere, the education glitterati. And they were basically like, well, you know, this, you know, this success academy is asking too much of these parents. And, and it really raised this question for me. It was like, okay, so, so what is the right amount to ask from a family? Like, if you are a school or a school leader, if you are a, if you are a non-charter school leader, a non-independent school leader, you run a, a traditional school district or whatever, what is the right amount of expectation to have or to ask for, for from a family? Is it nothing? Is, is it a lot? Like, is there sort of a, a, a scale there? And so I feel like now is a really important time to see if you are a, a state education leader, if you're a district leader, if you're a school leader, to, to reseat that expectation and be like, hey, this only works if we're both gripped firmly, you know, <laughs> if, if, if the handshake is a uh, a strong and, and memorable one. So I don't, I don't think we should let that opportunity uh, fade away either. I think I'm going to answer it's, that too. Oh, go ahead, Nikki. Sorry. No, just I think it's an important point. Like my notes to myself, I said, you know, like I love the handshake idea, whereas I see far too many schools right now doing the Heisman instead, right? Where it's the, you have no role in this. This is the tier to the experts, right? I mean, we have all seen videos of the school, you know, teachers and school board members who are like, you know, this is, what do you know about education? And how are we supposed to feel about that, right? I mean, when we see over a thousand districts and counting that have parental exclusion policies say you don't have a right to know your child's gender at school, how the hell am I supposed to feel? I mean, like, okay, you don't want me here? Fine, I won't be here. I'm not going to give to the PTA. I'm not going to show up for the parent-teacher conference. And so I think it kind of ends up becoming the self-fulfilling prophecy. I want to I want to add to that just what uh, Darrell mentioned. I I think I think he made a, the the handshake makes a great case for school choice altogether, um, because the parent is 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 given the opportunity to shake the hand of the school that makes the most sense for them, um, and and I think that's a place where um, you know it just is common sense uh, to say that if you empower the parent to make the decision on the school that, that fits their child, they're more likely to be engaged with that particular school and have more of that firm handshake. Uh, and so uh, whether he intended to make the comment and the, uh, or, or the, the point, I don't know, but he, he makes a very good point here uh, around the need for, for school choice uh, to create a firm handshake. Well, it's on a related, and I'm sorry, I seem to be having some kind of tech thing where I think I've been uh, freezing up or something. Um, on a related note, obviously, there's a lot of concerns about uh, school discipline right now. We've seen a lot of coverage of chaotic classrooms. We've seen a lot of survey data, which suggests concerns. What should we be doing differently? What's the problem and how do we address this? Wow. Well, okay, I, I, I can go first. I, I'll, I'll just say that the, the problem of discipline right now is not just a problem of school discipline. Um, I, I feel like we unleashed something um, primal from the dark heart of the American psyche, whatever, you know, <laughs> during the lockdowns, et cetera. And it has continued to run among us in a, in a way that is deeply problematic. Uh, you know, when I'm reading about uh, carjackings in DC and the, the like the uh, lo local officials are saying well don't ride alone right like that that's the answer don't ride alone I mean, it, like the, there's clearly clearly something larger at play here I do think though kind of to to your whole um push uh, uh from from the book you have to decide that order matters and then you have to convey that it matters in a meaningful way. And I think a, a, a lot of, uh, you know, to, to your point about um, values, community, these other things, we have conveyed to lots of people that there are other things that, that compete with order that are more important. Um, and a back to basics approach on that, I think is, uh, is timely and worthwhile. I mean, I think it ties very closely to the lack of civics education in our country, right? If you don't appreciate or care about the laws and the rules of this country, 
and you think it's built upon a foundation of injustice, why should I follow the rules? Be it on the streets, be it in the classroom. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, I was in Singapore and Thailand over Christmas break and just looking at, you know, nobody litters, there's no homeless people and, you know, the respect for the rule. And it's not that everybody fears being caned, although obviously that is part of it. Um, but it is also right that it is people actually believe in, there are a few laws that are rigorously enforced. Um, and we don't see that happening in the classroom. I mean, we have written extensively about restorative justice, which I know everyone on the call, you know, knows about. And there are some problems where you just can't kumbaya your way out of them. I mean, that girl who had her brains bashed in in St. Louis recently, you know, what about that? Like, you know, it's so I just, you know, watching how some of this dysfunction is spilling over, no consequences. And then when those kids are put back into the classroom, having, you know, acted out, they don't, not only are they not learning because they obviously don't want to, they're preventing every other child in the classroom from learning and they're setting everyone back. And so as much as we see people screaming, you know, equity from the rooftops, it's they're holding back classrooms of children. And I think that's reprehensible. I, I want to uh, amen Nikki's comments there, but also just say that, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's about expectations um, in the classroom and in the school. It's about uh, respectful relationships. And that and that means the teacher has to offer respect to the student and the student to the teacher. And I think it's about accountability on all, all sides. But uh, at the same time, I, I think that uh, in many ways, the system uh, has, has been too lax and has allowed these types of behaviors, uh, the, these soft on discipline approaches um, to happen. Uh, and, and what we see as a result of that is um, we see teachers being unable to teach and other students in the classroom being unable to learn because of the disruptions that are happening. And so I'm, I'm over that. You know, I think, I think we have to uh, make sure that we set expectation, hold people accountable, demand respect um, from all parties, but every student in the classroom should have the opportunity to learn free from, free from distraction. Uh, and, and we have to, we have to get back there uh, and we have to take this seriously. Um, because it's very important because we'll continue to drive effective teachers out of the classroom uh, if they feel like they can't teach without disruption. Um, and at the same time, students are not going to get the learning that they need and deserve if they're if they're constantly being disrupted um, by a small, very small number of students. I think by the way, we're pointing out too that union leadership has really hung teachers out to dry on this, right? Where they're pushing these restorative policies. I mean, you see what the NEA and the AFT vote out at their annual assembly versus why teachers are actually leaving the classroom. It's about this. Um, it's not about pay. It's not about political teachers. It's about, I'm not being backed up when I'm trying to control my classroom. And you know that to me is a, that's an opportunity for conservatives. Mm. And actually, and we're getting some terrific questions. Uh, we're going to get to those in just a couple minutes. So I want y'all to rest assured. Mike, I mean, on this point, Nikki just made, um, you know, the the fact is right the the NEA keeps saying we're worried about uh you know we're worried about problems we, we you know with with, with uh, discipline in schools we're worried about people being too harsh on kids um and teachers are saying man i wish somebody had my back what's going on and what should we be doing about that i mean just conservatives fun fumbling the ball right which is like this is such a space where we should be leading. And, you know, we make the point in the book, which I think is true, is that like the fact that more teachers aren't conservatives is a failure on the part of conservatives, right? To say with, and, and student discipline is like a perfect example of this. There's all the stuff around bureaucracy and pay that we talk about as well, which we can sort of, but as Nikki said, and, and I think any of us who know teachers or who are around teachers, if you talk to them, you know, for years, people have talked about, they want to get paid more, they want different things, but we all hear now, you're hearing about student discipline. You're hearing about like, that's that's what's driving them sort of crazy right now. Um, and I think that this is a, a great opportunity, but but the kind of irony of all of this is that the, the points th that were made now, which I wholly agree with, is this rebalancing that needs to take place where we, we need to think about the many instead of the few has us sounding like communists or something, right? <laughs> where we're saying, because the balance has been so much on the one or two kids in the classroom that has been misbehaving and what happens to them and how they're being punished and others. And we're sort of saying, well, okay, we should care about that. And I don't think either of us, and we're, we're explicit in the book that we're not advocating for zero tolerance or draconian discipline and things. All we're saying is, what about the other 25 kids? 
And if it gets to the point where that child is ruining the opportunity for everybody else, uh, you know, we need to rethink that. And I think, look, all of us have had these experiences recently. If you've been on an airplane where one person kicks off and your flight gets delayed, or if you've been on a bus or on a subway car or something where someone's kind of having a rough day, it becomes very clear to all of us, wow, there's like 200 of us here and one person can, can ruin it for everybody. If we want to have these shared spaces, if we want to live in community with one another, if we not, if we don't just want to, you know, go from our house to our car to some working pod where we're by ourselves, we have to enforce these kinds of norms. Otherwise, the world becomes sort of unlivable, and classrooms are no exception to that. Yeah, I just want to do one quick thing on this. Mike, Mike does something really good here, other than stealth dropping a Star Trek quote, which I was really impressed mm -hmm. by. Um, is is that uh, in, in the book you talk about the other half of the equation, which is that school choice is good for teachers, and it it it, it should like I don't want to glide by it. Like if you work in a monopoly system where somebody negotiates the rules for you, and the and and the rules promote disorder, you need an option too, right? <laughs> like a, as an educator, I right? mean maybe they would negotiate different rules if you were like this is this is out of control. You, you know, you didn't negotiate a good deal for me, let alone good pay. I'm going to the local independent school. They value the things I value. Maybe I won't make as much, but the school won't be out of control. You know, like that, that sends a message to lots of different people, union leaders uh, uh, among them. A couple wonky things I want to ask about. Um, one, we just touched on it, teacher pay. Um, what should we be doing that we're not doing today when it comes to how we think about paying teachers and staffing schools? Yeah, I, I love talking about this issue, so I'll, I'll happily step in and, and go first. Look, I, I, I think that, you know, we can call our teachers heroes and, and we can say they're great and all that, and, and that's important. Uh, but in many ways, it is about pay and, the, and teachers deserve to be fairly compensated. You know, they also deserve to, to work free of disruption, uh, to make sure that they have the art of, of teaching restored. Um, but but for me, you know, I, I fundamentally and, and, and am on the record with this. You know, we need to make sure teachers have a strong base pay. We need to make sure that that's available. But beyond that, I, I think we have to look at this in a market responsive type of way. You know, we have to look at um, school system uh, leaders have to be CEOs on this front and, and, and look at paying additional resource, additional dollars to, to teachers in, in content areas where the market says there's a, a need, whether it's high school math, high school science, K-12 special education, you know, in a market responsive way, we need to address that. Uh, I think schools that are more difficult to staff, um, we need for various reasons, we need to make sure that, that those teachers are incentivized through pay to, to work in, in those environments. Uh, and then also, I think that that teachers who are really just knocking it out of the park. I, I'm a former principal and, and have walked door to door in classrooms. Uh, and there oftentimes is a difference uh, from, you know, uh, room 12 to room 14 in the quality of teaching. And, and if room 14 teacher is is really knocking it out of the park with student outcomes, shouldn't we be in a position to pay that teacher more for the great work that they're doing? And so I think that we need to make sure that, that teachers have a, a strong base pay. Um, we need to make sure all the, the non-compensation elements are taken care of, but also we need a market responsive approach to this to, to really slice our vacancies and attract more people into the classroom. All right. Another one, uh, which I think we uh, there's a lot of mixed feelings on the right, testing and accountability. Um, I think there's both the sense that we want to hold school, especially public bureaucracies, responsible for serving kids well, but there's also concern about overreach and hyper-regulation. What's the way forward as we think about that? As a person who has no responsibility to implement this, but a lot to think about it, I'll, I'll throw something out there. So, um, uh, and I'll answer the question by not answering it. So you regulate a market and a, and a monopoly differently. And I feel like where we are moving toward um, is a system where you have um, uh, uh, state agency, state control, whatever, and states will probably use testing, annual testing, to figure out how you know what they're doing, and they will do something with that, which is called accountability. 
or they will do nothing with it, which is only called transparency, right? And so I would just say that most states in America have systems of transparency, not accountability. Um, what is different now is that we're talking about adding more and more of what a parent thinks along this paradigm, right? As, as So on this side, you have like the states in charge, you got, you're, you're using testing. On this side, you have like a parent's in charge and testing might be a part of it. Like it's, it's like a little more nuance. And I, I just think about, um, you know, Thomas Sowell's great quote about why price matters, because like price is actually an incredibly nuanced uh, uh, take on something's quality, right? Like there's millions of pieces of information that, that go into that. And so what happens between here and here, I think that's where all the fun is. Like, and and f fun sounds like a little pejorative, but we're going from a system of, if you're, if you're um, we're going from a system where you, if you were a parent, you didn't have that much money and you might have a couple of choices to one where you have real buying power and you might have a lot of them. And I, I, and you know, I think that's awesome, right? Like that, that is um, uh, a real change. Now, at the same time, there are families that still very much value our annual assessment ritual, right? That like we, we spent 20, 25 years telling people that this stuff was important. Some of them got the message. They think it's really important, you know? And so we need, we need to preserve that as well for the families who, who want to have, who want to be a part of that. So to me, it's like, you know, you can't be, you can't be for choice when people choose things that you don't like and be like, no, no, I'm not for that anymore. And, and there are, there are some really positive things about our annual assessment regime, but there is an opportunity to, opportunity to do something different, more interesting now. And I'm very excited about that. Rick, you're on mute. I just realized that. Thank you. All right. Uh, I want to start getting to some of these questions that have backlog. And uh, so answer to, uh, first question. It's one thing to be a conservative education leader in a red state, uh, but another to be a conservative leader in a blue in a blue environment. Um, how do you maintain your principles while making the compromises necessary to lead effectively? I'm going to let Kate take that. I don't compromise ever. Can we talk about pay again? <laughs> um, no, no. I mean, look, I, I don't I don't know how to answer that from the perspective of of being in a a blue state, so to speak. But but what I can answer is, uh, Rick, what you alluded to earlier in the conversation, my lived experience uh, for the last four years up until this January, um, my state board was basically evenly split along party lines. Um, my state legislature uh, was a, a red legislature overall, and, and our governor uh, was a Democrat. And so on a on a constant uh, everyday basis, you know, we we were we were having to um, work through policy initiatives that we felt like would produce the best outcomes for students in that particular environment. Uh, and we did that. Uh, and, and we didn't compromise on on principle. Um, but we did look at areas where both sides, quote, of the aisle could agree. You know, I, I received very little pushback when we're talking about things such as the science of reading. You know, we have a literacy crisis. Everyone realizes that. Um, the same thing with things like career and technical education, which has been undervalued and trade skills have been underappreciated for way too long. You know, I think both sides of the aisle can, can agree with those types of things. So there are there are points uh, where I think, you know, both sides of the aisle can, can work together and agree. Uh, but, you know, there are other places where you're just not going to find agreement. For, for instance, I think we, you know, as an example, we work to put a number of school choice bills uh, on our former governor's desk that ultimately he vetoed. And so that's that's the power of the office. You know, we we worked those through a legislative process, got them to a position uh, where all they needed was a signature uh, and they were vetoed. And so I, I think that um, uh, what I would what I would say about that is that no one no one should compromise on their principle. Uh, and we did not compromise on our principle. But but certainly we tried to find places where we knew there were shared interests and we tried to elevate those those areas to get wins for kids like reading, career and technical education, uh, et cetera. But at the same time, we, we lost battles around uh, opportunities such as, 
you know, raising the bar of what's expected in our high schools. We lost battles around school choice. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we won some, we lost some, but I'm really excited about the moment in time that we have in front of us now, because it feels like in our state, uh, we have a lot of alignment uh, with the work that we all believe needs to uh, get done. Well, I mean, you guys work in blue states and red states. When you're working with folks who, you know, Republicans or conservatives in red in blue states, um, are there things that you've learned or things that you share with them in trying to move some of this forward? Yeah, I think so. Uh, a couple of things I, I really appreciate um, both Nikki's unwillingness to compromise and uh, and <laughs> and and Kate's principal stance there. Um, so uh, I think a couple of things matter. One thing is how you define success. So a lot like like uh, uh, for Cade, you know, we define success by passing laws that help make the world better for kids. And so we behave in a way that is aligned to that goal. Um, there are lots of other people who work in red states and blue states. That is not their goal, right? Their goal is to just do, you know, how Stella got her groove back and set the car on fire and walk away and feel good about it, right? So so, so one really important thing is to have a strong North Star that is definable success. The second thing is you got to be circumspect about, about what you talk about. I mean, I, I think that's kind of the, you know, you're there to help make the world better, not to make yourself feel better. Uh, and so one of the things that I would say is important across our blue states and our red states is that our people are, you know, um, they're authentic. They are very open about what their motivations are, but um, but they're also careful about, <laughs> about because people have different values. Sometimes people want the same things for different reasons that like. So this is really that this is really important. The last thing I would just say is that it's all got to add up to something. Like whether or not we uh, to uh, to the Louisiana example, you know, you get there and and you're like, we want to do school choice, and the governor's like, no, 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 I want to do, you know, like get the right mortgage choice, right? Which is which is a a thing that that happens. In the end, you got to have a a bigger positive vision for the world than just the blood sport that kind of you know characterizes our regular interaction about this stuff. And you know, for us, it's like. Uh, you know, national cohesion, right? Like uh, uh, sh shared values and principles. Um, the fact that we have something to protect, which we do. <laughs> like I, I feel, I feel like that's like that's almost like a a, a loss message for for all of its flaws. Like we may have the greatest ideals ever for a nation, and the process of trying to live up to them is hard, right? And what we see every day is is that it's hard right and people who aren't well educated it for them it's even harder right so so those are the the kinds of things um uh that we do i will also tell you that the fact that we're in blue states and red states is a feature not a defect because the the the, the what you amass what you learn from different places different contexts different people different beliefs is uh is invaluable okay uh nikki how can conservatives meaningfully engage with cultural issues in schools without just slipping in a culture war? Um, how, uh, put another way, how can conservatives do a better job of engaging cultural issues in a respectful, principled manner? Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing I think is, um, you know, and I, I only speak in war metaphors, so maybe I'm not the best person to do this, but um you know, I, I think about, you know, some people on Twitter, like they'll say swords up. Like I, you know, we try and tell people, put your weapons down. Like actually, like we're so used to assuming everyone has ill intent and ill motives um, that to really take a step back. I mean, you know, as we have all alluded to, teachers have a hard job, right? Like when you're trying to be an MMA, you know, referee and an emotional support animal, as well as a math teacher, like that's a real lot. And they're pulling curriculum offline. Um, and so that's just kind of like, here's the handout. And it's not always like I'm going to like, you know, change your child, you know, like it's not always this secret nefarious, like, you know, Smurf plan. Um, it's, you know, sometimes it's really just like, I don't know, like I was looking for a world history thing that was like a coloring page, the end. Um, and so to, to try and go into it at, we tell people start small, smart, low, ask questions. Um, and don't like, don't, you don't need to like drop the federal lawsuit from like, like the first step. Um, you could work your way up to it. Like I love, I love to sue a person, but um, you know, but 
really try and, and yeah, like, you know, figure out like, you know, where everybody, you know, everybody has their own battles. And so I think that's one thing where we try and kind of, you know, we also do a lot of polling too. I mean, you know, the two extremes are very, very loud, but most people, I mean, you look at a title nine, you look discipline, you look at, I mean, even in your book, when you talk about rigor and quality, like most people want, I mean, even taking a step, why do people emigrate to America? Because they want their children to have a better life than they did, right? And so I want my child when they go to school to be uplifted and inspired and not told you're a loser, you suck, you can't do anything because of the color of your skin and like, you know, the everything you have, you have like all the baggage you brought into the class. And my kid's like, I'm 10, like, what is this? And so, but like, there are certainly there are bad apples and we have seen in different schools, like one bad apple, like one teacher will bully an entire school. Um, and that sucks. And we have to be able to get rid of those people too, but not everyone who is in the education blob is a bad person. And so I, I, I try to encourage people to start from there. Hmm. And Nikki, uh, you know, one question I get asked sometimes is, are the concerns about um, books in school libraries, so like the concerns about pornographic text or whatever, are those legitimate or is this just conservative parents looking to pick a fight and this is something they're seizing upon? I think it's something that some people do feel very passionately about. You know, at the end of the day, my big concern is that kids can't read. You know, my nine-year-old and my 10-year-old default to reading graphic novels because they're still just not comfortable after being out of school for two years of their formative experience are just not comfortable reading. Like, that's something that really, really worries me. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's access, you know, there's there's questions of, is it being read in a classroom, you know, versus is it being, is it available in a locker room? I think there are so many shades of gray and there's you know, on on both sides, and I certainly blame the media for this oversimplification, right? You say, do you want books burned? And 100% of Americans say no. And then you say, do you want your five-year-old reading this? And people are like, oh, no, not that either. And so it's, you know, there's so much mischaracterization. It's kind of the, the cheap political points. But I do think most people are, they're concerned with like other aspects. Like I think the book, I think that, you know, the book thing is why are our kids learning LGBTs before ABCs? Like, I think there's like, we sort of have our priorities wrong. You have our kids for eight hours a day. And if we're spending four to six hours talking about big feelings and identity politics and like only two or three hours actually doing core curriculum, that's not why I send my kids to school. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, Rick, you and Mike write, uh, in the book, there's nothing noble about throwing public funds at ineffectual schools, programs, or self-interested lobbies. Uh, Jarrell mentioned the 190 billion federal emergency funding smash and grab. Um, so we know that many districts uh, wasted the 200 billion in federal ESSER funds, uh, and that they haven't gotten the results we need, and that they're about to show up demanding even more money because the ESSER is running out. Um, how should uh, Washington, how should states respond to the demands for more? I'll, I'll, I'll go first and, and be quippy. Um, so uh, last last summer with your uh, colleague, Dr. Ned Malkus, I uh, had a, an opportunity to testify before Congress about this. Um, and in the long form, which you know nobody knows, uh, the last paragraph sort of broached this issue. Um, I do think that the challenges of learning loss, pandemic recovery, whatever, are are real and that the harm of the last three years is going to be with us for the next 30 unless we do something about it. And that probably want, like requires more money. Um, what my advice to the congressional leaders at the time would have been was to be cautious and bold, cautious about how much you give and bold about who you give it to. Um, and so that that I think is the the difference, you know, like the the fact that the NEA AFT basically got the administration to go from gear, which was flexible and under polit sort of like had political incentives because governors used it to only SEAs and only LEAs like that. That was a, a that was very strategic to cut out all the innovation, you know, so there's a a chance to revisit that. And I think the moment is uh, is really important to, to do so. I mean, Mike, uh, the Biden budget proposes $8 billion for mini Esser. Good idea? Bad idea? Should we support this? You know, it's, I was reminded by what Darrell said. There was a great quotation was the Nobel Prize winning economist Angus Deaton. I heard him on a podcast once and his, his, his line was, you know, it's going to take more money to improve education 
but it will not improve education by giving it more money. Um, and I think it's the same sort of idea there, which is if you put, not to go all biblical, but like putting new wine into old wineskins tends not to work. So look, I think that this was so predictable too. I mean, how many of us at the time were saying, hey, they're going to get these truckloads of money and they're going to hire people. And if you hire people, those people will still have jobs after the money runs out and everyone's going to say, oh my God, you're cutting all of this money from us um, when it's like not. So, so look, I think part as someone who doesn't actually have to run a school system and someone who's more on the, you know, the writing and speaking kind of thing, I think us being able to be more direct and calling out things like what is a budget cut and what isn't and like policing that kind of language to be like, oh, hey, getting a bunch of money and then not getting that big, but like one off spending isn't a budget cut. It was a temporary infusion of money that you no longer have. Um, it's the same thing, like having growth in funds that are not as much as you otherwise would have wanted are not, that's not a budget cut. It's not as much of an increase as you would have liked. So I think like that sort of stuff. And, and part of this, I think we need to hold journalists accountable because the way that this is covered in there is, is not the same. So a fair dose of media criticism is probably due. Um, but yeah, intense skepticism towards all of this. So, so should, should the schools get their 8 billion or no? No, no, okay. no, no. Uh, Cade. Uh, test scores on NAEP and PISA show the achievement gap between our highest performing kids and lowest performing kids has grown substantially over the last 10 plus years. What's what's this, you know, what should conservatives be for as far as addressing this? Yeah, I mean, for, for one, I think outside of the parent or guardian, there's nothing more important than a high quality teacher for kids. And so whenever systems are exploring how to use their resources, I think they have to prioritize teachers to make sure that uh, all kids have access to a high quality teacher and not just some kids. Um, and then I think we need to look at um, differentiation in the terms of, of high dosage tutoring. You know, you, you go to a doctor's office if you're sick and they say, you know, you have this particular illness and, and here's the prescription and you need this dosage of whatever medication. Uh, I think the same could be true for our tutoring efforts. We need to uh, be able to understand what the exact deficiencies are or strengths uh, for every single student and then build individualized plans for them that would incorporate the appropriate dosage of tutoring to meet their individual needs. And so I think as we move forward and, and one of the silver linings of, of where we have all been over the last few years is this growing body of research around the importance of high dosage tutoring uh, and the impacts it can make. And so that's one of the reasons why I think that uh, for our state, uh, whether it's uh, the restructuring of the school day uh, to provide for tutoring or whether it's vouchers for families and after hours uh, to to go and, 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 and pay for their own private tutoring, uh, I, I want to be the first state in the country to be able to say kids, families, if you need additional support uh, in the form of during day tutoring or an after school uh, voucher to pay for tutoring, we want to have it available for you. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that we can do outside of ensuring a high quality teacher uh, as we move forward. Nikki, uh, on this, I mean, one of the thesis that's been floated is that technology, especially, right, we're talking about ubiquitous phones over this last 10, 15 years have had differential effects on high achieving, low achieving kids. High achieving kids uh, have earned stable households, they get exposed to a lot of reading. And so for them, you know, the technology can even be at least academically a plus, even if it's destroying their emotional and mental health. Um, but low income kids, if they don't have that stability at home, if they're not exposed to books, uh, the ubiquity of gaming and social media might kind of corrode. Um, I'm curious, as you work with parents and families, I know technology kind of is one of those things you hit. What's your experience with it in terms of the, the achievement gap between kids that we're concerned about? Oh, so, I mean, my kids are varsity Roblox players, just to like lay that out there. Um, but, you know, that being said, um, you know, we, we did some polling last year and parents across the board, you know, this is one of those like 80, 20, 90, 10 issues. Parents are worried about screen times, the amount of what their kids are exposed to, you know, as your kids get older, you don't have access to who they're chatting with. I mean, you know, there's like the content, right? We saw the TikTok, like the pro Osama bin Laden stuff all the way through to the cyberbullying, right? Where the little girls are like killing themselves or they're becoming anorexic, right? So there's like a huge amount of stuff out there, like the catfishers, like, so across the board, I think social media is, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to read Jonathan Heights, like Atlantic article now about like cutting kids off. It's like on my to-do list. 
Um, but it is something really that unifies people. I think it's been really interesting, you know, even just over the past week, looking at the TikTok vote in the House about, you know, that bringing, you, like, you can't get 350 House members to vote on naming a post office, like, much less, like, you know, like putting in place guardrails on like a foreign owned company is fascinating to me. And so I think this is on everyone's radar, but no one really kind of knows how to do it. I mean, like in our house, we fight about like, should we tell the kids they can only watch screens for two hours? No, but we kind of want to be alone. Right. And so I think it's, we are in this brave new world of charting it. Um, This is like a rambling long answer, like a non-answer. Um, But it is, it's really problematic. That being said, you know, some of the tips that we get in through our tip line are because kids pulled out a phone and they listen, you know, they recorded their teacher's 12 minute rant about why Hamas is a resistance effort. I mean, so it's, you know, those kinds of things are interesting because it is still holding teachers accountable as well. And, you know, with school shootings, right, kids, parents wanting to chicken and their kids, like I'm not in the place where I'm like, I'm going to say across the board unequivocally no, but I do think that um, there's a lot, there's a lot of problems. Last question, uh, Darrell, it's directed to you, other folks jump in if you want. Um, you're trying to build a bipartisan movement to get states to expand school choice, but school choice is coded as conservative today. Is this perception make your life tougher as you work into grow choice? And second, why the heck is choice coded as conservative? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so the the most important thing is that everybody likes school choice. The que- the, the the question is, how do you like it for everybody? Ah, that's the first time I said that. That's it, right? Everybody likes it, but do you like it for everybody? So when you're in blue states, people are like, I like it for me because I like my mortgage and I like my publicly subsidized private school. And then they're like, maybe I like it for the poor kids who are like way away from me, but only under certain circumstances, right? And then you go to, I don't know, you go to Texas and they're like, yeah, we like the charter school thing. But, you know, the rural Republicans, the, the you know, the ones that are left after this election cycle, you know, those guys are like, we don't know about this whole like, you know, private school thing because we don't have any, you know, you know, whatever. So I would just say that there are like um, uh, there there are uh, striations, right, like, like there um, that are uh, that are important. As for why it's um, it's it's uh, sort of coded as conservative. I think it's just because conservatives have been more open about the fact that like individual choice matters, if not more than at least equally than uh, state interest. Um, And that is not a thing that you hear in blue states very often, right? Which is that it's like our shared institutions, um, you know, democracy, which has a different definition every four years at this point, at least up where I am, you know. Um, It dies in darkness, man. It dies in darkness. All all the time, all the time. And so I'm on Team Democracy, just to be clear for the people in the chat. Uh, So so, um, I, I for one, am, am biased toward the individual because individuals have shorter time frames than institutions do. And I think a willingness to acknowledge that even though, as your you know, your book cites that like institutions, particularly long, ones that have a long life cycle, tend to tend to uh, sort of assert sh- like po- positive knowledge, like they're worth protecting. Like it's it's easier to mess something up than to make something that lasts. Like like uh, like all of this. Um, like even though I think that's that's true, I I I find that co-equal with you know, listen, my kid needs to learn how to read tomorrow, you know, Um, and a a market approach, I think, respects that more than a collective approach that that is anchored in in uh, the idea of traditional public school. All right. We're at the two minute mark. Um, Final shots. Final. If you you have one thing to share with the uh, with 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 the viewers out there that they ought to take away from this. Uh, Mike, uh, throw it to you first. One thought, what one quick thought that folks should take away from this thing? I mean, I would say just off what Darrell was saying, I hope that things like rigor, like choice, like flexibility and things are not always thought of 
as conservative or as coded as conservative. I want this to be common sense that lots of people can can find that in. And part of the effort of our book was to appeal to broadly shared values so that people from across the spectrum can support these things. They may be temporarily coded as conservative, but I hope it will become broader over time. Nikki, final thought? I think the through line for me is it's parental engagement and empowerment. Like we all saw that our children have different learning styles, like they thrive in different environments. And so if you know what your kid's learning and, you know, it's a good fit for them, like my two kids have very different styles. And so for parents to be able to know and then to be able to act on that choice, I think is is, is really important. So that's where I see kind of the, the overlap of your issues and my issues. Darrell, final thought? Uh, I, I would just say uh, th thank you for having me. But also, like when you look at the polling, everybody loves everything we've talked about today. The the challenge is the political incentives aren't always aligned for the elected folks who have to vote on these things. So so the people are less liberal, conservative, and more uh, good, better, different, you know, than uh, than they had been in a long time. And that's a great opportunity. Cade, final thought. Pick up a copy of your book, uh, Getting Education Right. Uh, you may not agree with everything, uh, but it's certainly worth the read. It's worth the engagement. Uh, and a shout out to Mike and Rick for putting this together. Thanks, Kate. Uh, appreciate you guys making the time. A couple final thoughts. One, uh, Kate just flashed a book. Um, if this has got you curious, go find it uh, online or bookstore near you, Getting Education Right. Uh, if you go to the Teachers College Press website, and you just enter the code AEI, uh, you get a 20% discount. Um, if you think these guys are great, we're going to do this whole thing again uh, with some folks who are going to try to kind of bring as much of an A game uh, as Nikki, Durrell, and Kay did uh, in a converse to a conversation about early childhood and how do we get early childhood education right. Uh, that'll be on April 3rd. Uh, you'll find all the information at the AEI website. Guys, thank you so much for both for joining us today, but more importantly, for the fantastic work you do. Um, much, uh, you know, much appreciation. Thanks much. And thank all of you for joining us today. It's been terrific. Take care.